Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome into the show that's on in the afternoon. We've got a really cool show today. Oh, Very exciting. St. Augustine Film Festival has kicked off. Yes, sir. And a lot of films happening through the weekend mm -hmm. as well. Um, we've got Denny Tedesco and Leland Scott, Leland Sklar. Yes. Oops, there's my dyslexia kicking in. Uh, <laughs> English you have good, sir. <laughs> as well, yeah. Something like that. Immediate Family, the documentary. <sighs> Awesome. Yeah, Can't wait for this, this one. This is going to be really cool. Yeah. I'm really intrigued by this. Uh, so we're going to talk to these guys a little bit about that. They're legendary careers. Yes. Uh, themselves. And uh, it's going to be a lot of fun. We're also going to catch you up on everything happening in and around St. Augustine. We're going to get your horror scopes in uh -huh. and uh, hopefully get you a couple chuckles before yeah, we get out of here. Yeah, I'll fix it. Yeah. yeah. All, gotcha. right. <laughs> All right. Yeah, you always got to always gotta fix it from yeah. those horror Just scopes, lift man. Lift it up. Yes. There you go. <laughs> uh, we will start, as we do every day, by telling you about our great friends at Bozard Ford Lincoln who help us have these conversations every week. Um, Bozard Ford Lincoln is here for you. You can experience their extensive selection of new and pre-owned vehicles, quick and quality servicing, and their parts and accessories shop that is just absolutely second to none. It's going to blow your mind out there. Make sure you grab a signature burger at Ford's Garage hmm. while you're there. The 904 Now Burger, I would recommend. You I hear better. it's pretty good. Absolutely. Here it's the best-selling burger they've got. Yes, of all time. <laughs> of all time. <laughs> they offer services from home delivery to company fleet servicing. Out there at Bozard Ford Lincoln, your family is their family, and they are driven to inspire. Uh, also, our friends at the Bailey Group, no matter where you want to go, they're going to help you get there together. Their absolute top priority is helping you take care of yourself and your family. They want to learn more about your personal situation. They want to identify things like your dreams and your goals, and then even understand things like your risk tolerance. Mm -hmm. Long-term relationships that encourage open and honest communication have been the cornerstone of their foundation of success. Give them a call today, 904-461-1800. And then, of course, our friends at Ah, or a Spa. If you are craving the perfect blend of relaxation and rejuvenation, ah, Mara Med Spa is your answer. From luxurious spa treatments to advanced medical aesthetics, ah, Mara's experts will personalize a plan just for you. Enhance your natural beauty with things like Botox, dermal fillers, laser treatments, and a whole lot more. Experience top-notch care in their state-of-the-art facility. Feel refreshed and revitalized at Ah Mara Med Spa, 2100 A1A South Suite 2. Book your next appointment now at theamaramedspa.com. Ah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's so great. Oh, hey, Denny Tedesco and Leland Sklar are still here. They didn't leave after that. Oh, All right, famous. great. Yes. Guys, how y'all doing this afternoon? Good to have you in studio. Yeah, see, it's catchy, yeah. right? You can't help yourself. I can't wait to see this later. <laughs> <laughs> A moment of zen, sir. There you, you go. My day. There you go. Uh, glad to have you guys in studio here yeah, with us this morning. Um, this is going to be fun. So, it, guys, give me a little bit of, uh, about your backgrounds. Um, uh, Denny, let me start with uh, you, man. Well, I am a filmmaker. Okay. Uh, I started in, in the 80s as a decorator. I was a lighting and technician and videos and all that through the years. Okay. And then it did IMAX films for a long time. Oh, and then, uh, what's the difference in doing regular films versus IMAX films? A lot of weight. A lot of weight. Carrying, a lot of weight. Okay. Carrying, equipment. A, carrying a camera was like huge. It, you know, in those days it was film that was... You'd have to carry this camera that was about 40, 50 pounds up a mountain. And it was a pain in the ass. Yeah, Ooh. yeah, yeah. I totally believe and that. I hated it. <laughs> uh, I got to go around the world. I, I dove with great whites. I got to go to, you know, safaris in Africa, all up and down Alaska, polar bears, grizzlies. That's a cool and, perk. Yeah, it yeah. is. No, it was a great perk. And then, it's, you know, but sooner or later when you realize... You know what? I don't want to get up that early and go up mm. that mountain with that camera and find out that it's cloudy. <laughs> there is a point where it's <laughs> just no, not worth it, it to you anymore. I, you know, and I was a technician at that point, and I wanted to just get in more into producing and directing. So in around 95, my father, who was a studio guitarist in Los Angeles, he uh, was diagnosed with cancer. And mm. I wanted to, to always tell his story because his story and his friend's stories were pretty unique. They were the guys that did... All of the work in L.A. in the 60s, they did the Beach Boys, Sinatra, Janet Dean, Mamas and Papas, Fit Dimension, wow. Sam Cooke. Wow. Anything that came into L.A. had studio musicians, usually in those days, because labels didn't trust the 
the players in the band. They weren't that mm. good. The band mm. guys. Interesting. Yeah. So they basically cover their butts. Yeah, you yeah, know? yeah. We got three hours. We got to get in, get out. Three hours, three hours. You could do three songs. And that's how those all this Phil Spector stuff. You had three hours to do a Be My Baby mm. and a, maybe a couple others. And so these guys were so busy. And then dad was diagnosed in 95. And I want to tell that story. And mm. so he started telling it and dad passed away in 97. And I kept going and making this film that I thought would be easy to make. Well, it took 19 years to finish. Yeah. Not because wow. of, I had it finished in 2008, but the licensing of music. There was oh, 110 sure. songs in this movie. You could still see this on Hulu. It's on all the paper places. And it's put as Hulu now. And... When you hear 110 songs and you know 100 of them, you can imagine the cost of what that was. Yeah. And at the time, uh, music docs were the kiss of death. Really? No one wanted to touch it. They thought, uh, no one's going to want to do that. Really? Yeah. It's such a time period, though. I mean, you're capturing a mosaic yeah, of but, incredible you know, But it was the business was changing in the film business. You know, distribution is like, well, right, it's not going right. to make its money back because it's right. going to cost this much to make a film like that. But it's only going to cost, make this much. So interesting. Yeah. So that's a tough. That's sell. where um, I got my my uh, chops in. Was that film? Cool. Okay. Yeah. What's the name of that film? It's called The Wrecking Crew. The and, Wrecking Crew. And the reason it was called The Wrecking Crew because the old studio musicians, the established guys, you know, the movie guys and all that, they said these guys are going to wreck the business playing this rock and roll crap. Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, and, you know, the Beach Boys didn't play on Pet Sounds. A lot of these albums they didn't play on because they had let, gave the studio musicians the job to do it. Interesting. Yeah. Wow. And what about tour? Like, how did they do that? Well, because tour you have, it's easy. You only need 10 songs, 12 songs, whatever to memorize. Yeah. So the bands have weeks to rehearse. Got it. So when the studio musicians go in, they, they're given a piece of music. Okay, let's go. Wow. So, so they're nailing things. this down within a, a few hours. And then the bands learn that music. You know, it's not mm. most of the bands could play. They just didn't have the studio chops, as they say. Got it. There's a whole different world. A great example is um, Mr. Tambourine Man, you know, which was, you know, the birds. And the producer, um, what was it? Um, uh, Debbie Reynolds' son, well, oh, um, Terry Melcher. Terry Melcher was Ooh. a producer, mm. and he said, "Listen, I'm going to bring in Roger McGuinn, you know, to play the lead and sing. You guys could sing on it." And they were all upset. David Crosby was livid, you know. Yeah. None of the other guys were allowed in the studio. But as to, as Roger McGuinn said, he goes, "Listen, we did the B A side, Tambourine Man, and the B side in three hours." He says, when we did Turn, 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 it took 77 takes. Wow. Yeah, they're both number one hits. Is how do you get there? Right. right. Yeah. And the producer, Terry Meltzer, his job is to get in, get out, get a hit. Yeah. And, you know, maybe it, it took too long. Maybe the label would have quit on yeah. them. You know, so. Interesting. I never knew this. Side yeah. of music. Huh. So, Leland, a uh, very amazing career yourself well, out here. Tell trying. the people who you are. Yeah, right? It never ends, right? No, it's no, never, no, especially it's, if it's something you love to do. When you're put under the dirt, that's when it's over. Right, right, right exactly. Right. Yeah. 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 Can you talk about some of your experiences, though? Like some, some memorable ones that we can talk to the artists? Oh, I, mean, I feel so fortunate that the, the career I've, I've managed to eke out for myself in the, all these years. Um, but for me, it really began... I mean, I was a player from when I was five years old. I was a classical pianist. Oh, cool. But when I was 12 years old going into junior high school, I kind of assumed I would be the piano player. And the, and the music teacher said, that we got 50 kids to play piano. We need a string bass player. And he pulled out an old K upright from the back room and showed me how to hold it. And I plucked one note on it and felt that vibration. And I just went, done. That's it I'm for ready. you. I'm ready. Uh, so, um, but I was always in bands, like all through the 60s. I was in a band, I mean... To, to tie into what Denny just said is I was in a band in 1967 called Group Therapy in L.A. And we were produced by Mike Post, who did all the TV shows, the theme for Law and & Order and mm. Rockford Files and Hill Street Blues and all those. Cool. Um, we, went, we got a record deal and we went in the studio. The Wrecking Crew played on our record. We weren't allowed to play on our album. We were too young and inexperienced. And really? I was sitting there looking through a window in 1967 at his dad, <laughs> at Hal Blaine, at Carol Kay, and, and all of these amazing musicians thinking to myself, I get it. 
This is why these guys are here, because yeah. they were nailing songs <clears throat> like that. And uh, I thought I could never do this. And three years later, I was working with them every day, that same bunch of people. So it's wow. been a, an interesting journey. But for me, it really changed in 1970 when I was in a band in Los Angeles called Wolfgang. And uh, our drummer had a dear friend uh, who had a studio in town. He used to come and hang out at our rehearsals. And at one of our rehearsals, he brought a friend of his who had just come back from England. And it was James Taylor, had oh. just returned from England. Wow. And uh, he came to our rehearsal and hung out with us and met us all. And just, it was a nice bullshit day. Yeah, we had nerves. Yeah, I mean, there was nothing yeah. really going yeah. on. There was nothing really going on. <clears throat> and um, the next thing you know, James gets offered a gig at the Troubadour in Los Angeles. And he had somewhat of a set band from the, the album. They had just cut the, J, the James Taylor album. Mm -hmm. They had done their Apple album in England, which really didn't do much of anything. And then he came back to the States and Peter Asher, who was, he was, he was part of Peter and Gordon of the, of the English invasion in the sixties became okay. the um, head of A&R for Apple records. And the first one of the first people he met was James Taylor and 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 signed James to, to Apple Records. And um, but they came back to the States and they were going to play the Troubadour and they had Danny Korchmar already because James and Danny had been in a band together. Right. Makes um, sense. The, yeah. yeah. So they he was playing guitar and Russ Kunkel, uh, Cooch, uh, 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 Peter had found him. He was playing with John Stewart. And uh, who was great, folky yeah. guitar player, singer. Um, so they had him, and Carol King was the piano player in yeah, the band because wow. nobody knew who Carol was. She was just a, this young girl who had massive amount of hits as a songwriter, but yeah. nobody knew who she was. And James met me at that that rehearsal, and he told Peter, he said, "I found my bass player." And they called me and asked me if I'd play this gig with them. So that's how we all came together. It was this all this kind of weird, perfect storm of of connecting. You don't seem like the person that gets starstruck, though. Like, so that didn't affect your talent at all. But he wasn't. Well, no, well, James, no, but James wasn't a star. Oh, no, nothing. nothing. Okay, no, wow. no, nobody knew who he was. Because you're just rattling off these names. I'm like, oh, Dean. Yeah, 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 nobody, yeah, no, yeah. nobody knew who anybody was. It's the beginning of everybody's careers. Wow. So we did that one gig. But I assumed I was going to play one gig. I was still in college at that point, And uh, I thought, we'll do this show and be fun. And I was in hard rock bands. I wasn't like a singer-songwriter kind of a player. I was like in a really heavy... Rock. I always loved Cream and Hendrix and oh, 10 yeah. Years After and all of that stuff. Um, so it was just a weird circumstance that brought us all together. And then the next thing you know, James is on the cover of Time magazine as the face of this new trend in music, the singer-songwriter movement. And we got swept up in this kind of musical tsunami with him. And next thing I know, I had to leave school because we were going on the road. And, and then... One of the things that really is pivotal in all our careers, and we talk about this in the documentary, which is an amazing documentary that Denny did on, on all of us, and it still blows my mind. But um, Peter Asher insisted that our names appear on the LP jackets. That's cool. And uh, the Wrecking Crew guys never got album credit. Nobody realized when they were listening to the Beach Boys and Sinatra that they were listening to the same players on all these records. Get out. So we got credit, and then... The labels were, when they saw what James was creating in terms of a movement, they started signing all these singer-songwriters, and they would look at James's album, and they'd see our names on it, and they'd go, well, if they're good enough for James, let's track those guys down. So we literally went from no studio experience to being the first call guys <laughs> wow. you know, overnight, you huh. know, and, and having to really learn our craft at the job. And, uh, and, and you're still learning today. I mean, I've been doing it 53 years, 54 years now, and every day's an adventure. Absolutely. You know, yeah. I mean, we're, we're here for this film festival, and uh, I, we go back on Monday. On Tuesday, I'm in the studio with Streisand. You know, we're, oh, we're Babs. Do, and then you better I, read and, the book. Oh, no. I She's going to come for you. It's a thousand pages. I've done five projects with her. God I bless. love She's her. Amazing. Yeah. She's Have you seen the mall? Have you seen her mall? Her you know, what? she has a mall at the basement of her house. It's all of the different things that she has done in her oh, career. Wow. And you go into like different stores. I'm oh, telling I'll have you, to ask her lady is <laughs> really on point. Oh, she's, yeah. she's fabulous. Yeah. You know, and the thing is, you know, like she got a reputation. For good, some people would say, oh, she's such a bitch. You know, blah, blah, blah. And I go, you know, the problem is she's the most professional person you'll ever want to work right. with. And she comes so prepared for her stuff. 
that if you're sitting there slacking off, she'll bust you. Absolutely. Yeah. And if she busts you, if a guy does it to some of these guys, right. they would go, oh, okay, if a woman does it to them, they mm. would a bitch. Well, yeah. what does bitch stand for? Yeah. Be in total control of herself. I mean, there's nothing wrong with that. <laughs> right? Right? Yeah, wow. That's exactly Absolutely. it. He's our acronym guy. <laughs> yeah, no, it's great. <laughs> yeah, so I'm sorry, I ramble on. No, you're that. good. But, I love no, this. But, but see, you know, I, I'm still excited. I mean, we're doing that and then leave on Thursday with Lyle Lovett for a bunch of gigs in Texas cool. and Oklahoma. I saw so. him a few years back here at our amphitheater. He put on a great show. Oh, Lyle's wonderful. That. I've been working with Lyle since 87. Wow, wow. very yeah. cool. Yeah, no, I love him. So how are you guys like in St. Augustine to kind of just to throw something random oh. out there? How you, how you guys like being here, hanging out? What have you been doing? Well, we, we came in the other night, and yesterday we actually just watched movies. Yeah. Okay. Which is really cool because usually I'm in and out of these festivals, and I barely get to watch anything. Mm. And I'm always kind of like working. For the last year, I've been doing the festival circuit with this film. And when you do the festival circuit, your goal is to get the word out. Mm. You really got to get it out. I mean, because mm -hmm. you're just trying to sell the film. It's not sold yet. At that and, point. At that point. So it's really, <clears throat> that's all you need to do is mentally. If you, know, you just made a film, great, we're going to show it. But it's like, now what? Yeah. And you have to spread the word. It's all about spreading the word. Luckily, we did sell the film. Okay. So this is actually the first festival I can relax. Oh, nice. That's got to be a good feeling. It is a great feeling. That's awesome. So tomorrow uh, tomorrow night, it's that beautiful theater, and it's just going to be fun. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And the, the great thing about this film, and I'm not saying it's because it's my film, you walk into the, the theater, and you got 50% of the people already know the music. Not 50%. 50% of the music is, that's what sucks you in. Right, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? And they all know the music. Uh -huh. And it just brings joy to, you know, it's not, listen, it's not like a documentary has changed in the world. You know what I mean? It, but it brings smiles to everybody's faces. And that's what's been fun, is watching people hear a song and watch them lip sync. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. or bop their heads. Right. And this and every song, and I realize each song in this movie is a bookmark in someone's life. Oh my god, I saw James yes. Taylor when I was a kid. Or I had that album. And I love what happens now is I I love that I you know, that was in high school. I used you know, watch them. Then it was my parents had that album. And then now it's my grandparents had that album. Yeah, and, yeah. And it's funny how generations. The but I'm music just thinking about down. the opus and like the entire vision of all of these incredible uh, musicians. How did you approach the storytelling aspect? All right, so that's a very good point. So what happened was in the Wrecking Crew, it was obvious it's about my father and a few of his friends. It was a small knit group in the '60s. There's like maybe 20 people that were, and it wasn't like a group. Yeah, it's like everybody's freelancers. But it was obvious in the 60s, there's these, and even in the movie, The Wrecking Crew, you'll see, well, there's 15, there's 20, there's 10. It didn't matter. It was a time period. And I focused on my father and some of the guys in his band, or not in his band, in within that group. Uh -huh. When they came to me on this film, so the producers, and they said, you know, what do you think of this? And they, the guys have this band called Immediate Family. Mm. Now, it's a, you know... And it's Leland, Wadi Wachtel, Danny Kochmar, Russ Kunkel, and a fifth guy who's named Steve Pistel. But the four legends that we're talking about, I went, I know them all. Yeah. I mean, not I only knew Leland personally. Yeah. But those were the legends to me because they were on every album I had in the 70s as a kid in high yeah. school. Wow. And obviously, coming from a studio father or a father that was a studio player, I followed that. Yeah, yeah. And I remember something that was really interesting is with Peter Asher, you know, interviewing him. And I said something about legends. And he looked at me like I was nuts. He goes, they weren't legends when we were working with them. He, you know, because that's their first jobs. Yeah. They become legends. And in my mind, they're legends, even though it's like their first albums, you know, like Russ Kunkel's first albums is, or is uh, Joni Mitchell's Blue. Sweet, oh uh, sweet baby James and um, tapestry. And tapestry. Wow. You know what I mean? So you could quit, you quit then. Your career could be stopped there. You have a hell of a career. Uh -huh. But what I'm saying is, they so they came to me with this idea. I went, I like this. I said, here's the reason I like it. I have a hook. The hook is they're called the immediate family. I can concentrate on these 
four guys. And in the wrecking crew at the beginning of the film, I started it with a voice story. I said, this is the story of my father and his extended family, mm -hmm. the wrecking crew. Now there's another group called the immediate family. And that's what the focus is. It's not about how great they are. They are all great, but there was more to it. There's a bond in musicianship, you know, where they have to listen to each other. Mm -hmm. You know, musicians do that. And, and they were able to survive 50 years. There's, they're not a band that's going to break up. No, you they're know, family. They're family. Yeah. yeah. And the difference between these guys and my father, my father never left his studio. He was in that studio for 12, 14 hours a day for years. You never left town to go on the road because you left town. There's another eight guys going to take your spot. Right. Yeah. Where these guys were so young, they didn't care. And the business started changing. So now James Taylor is basically, even Peter Asher is like, they're producing this album. Hey, let's put the band together and get Leland and Russ and Danny and go on the road to support the album they just recorded. Totally different you know, yeah. now, like he said, now everybody's looking at their names. That's who they want. So they're not afraid to leave town because they have, they've cornered their thing. They yeah. created that, that yeah. level. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. Very cool. And so are you, are you guys going to be talking to people out there at the film fest? Or are oh, you going to be doing, people um, are going to get the chance to talk to you guys no, and kind of pick your like brain a little bit? The Q and A is one of the best parts of doing this. Yeah. Uh, I, I mean, I love it. I, I would stay up there for hours if they let me in, and talk to people because there's so many questions yeah. that get yeah. asked to you. Have you answered most of them before, though, for no, the most no, part? Like, know, do you ever you get you a do, question but, thrown at you where you're like, you know what, yeah. that's a great question. Oh, I no, never it happens. That. So yeah. It's like being on your show. Yeah. 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 You know, I mean, I'm hearing <laughs> things today that I really didn't think of before yeah. I was standing outside that door. So yeah. it's just a magical experience for me. No, it no, is. No, 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 it's <laughs> you, you do get you do get the occasional question where you kind of go, "Wow. Wow. Let I me mean, give me a second here yeah. to think about yeah. that." Yeah. But I don't care about redundancy either because mm. It's that person's moment to ask the question. Mm -hmm. So you give them the same attention you gave the first person that asked that question. So, yeah. but it's 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 Which so kind of what you say in the film about playing fire, fire and rain. rain. Yeah, you could say that. You tell them that. You know? Yeah. Well, I mean, people have said you know you must have played fire and rain like a thousand times. Mm -hmm. You know, and, mm -hmm. and don't you get bored? And I go somewhere in that audience, somebody's hearing it for the first time, True. and that's who I'm playing to. I don't. I don't worry about like I've played this. I don't get bored with it and go, oh, there's three chords in this song. Mm. Yeah, you're you're you, you're in a relationship at that point with that audience, and you want to give them everything you possibly can at that moment, regardless if you've played the song a million times or not. It's somebody they're experiencing it that night, you know, and you're going to the next night and, and the same gig another yeah. night. So. I've never gotten tired of this stuff. I, I love it. No matter if, if I'm working, if I'm touring with Toto or I was with James or Phil Collins or any of these people, you treat it the same every every time you step on stage. It's a relationship with that audience. And doing the Q&As is just, I love it. You know, because these people, I, I, the, one of the things I get told more than anything is the stuff you work on is like the, the benchmarks of, in my life, like you said. Yeah. You know, or it's really... You know, it's not only the specific songs become like births, deaths, divorces, marriages, of course. everything. And it's kind of like maybe you live next to a field when you were a little kid and there was a certain clover mm -hmm. in that yeah. field. And you suddenly, years later, you find yourself in a place and you smell that. And for that instant, yeah. you're Stop. that kid again and you're yeah. like in there. Yeah. And it can last just almost a nanosecond, but it's all... You know, it, it's embedded in in you, that matter in your head, and they so they don't songs, make music like that like that anymore. They well, don't. there is great music though. You know, they're really it's so interesting <laughs> though to me because uh, in, in this generation, music was longer, and now nowadays it's shorter because of our attention spans. Yeah. I mean, yes. if you notice, an average song is about right. two minutes and thirty yeah. seconds yeah. long. Yeah. Where but, yours? No, no, wait, wait, that's very interesting. But don't forget AM radio. That's what the. You couldn't go past three minutes in AM radio. Interesting. Yeah, no, everybody, yeah. when you were cutting singles, they had to be within a very specific time frame. That's why they frame. call it radio edit, right? Yeah, okay. yeah, or the things would start being faded out before they were actually done. Yeah. But I think that my biggest issue with <laughs> contemporary stuff is that there's the listening experience has been diminished from the standpoint 
when I see people listening to music, they're mostly listening through ear pods uh, off of a phone or Correct. something. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Rather than sitting in a room, having that almost like a Japanese tea ceremony of, Love it. you know, cleaning the, you know, the dust off the needle and, you know, having yeah, your turn Yeah, I'm a vinyl collector, so I get yeah. it. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's it's there's totally something yeah. magical about sitting and dedicating a, a moment to listening to music rather than having music playing while you're doing a million other things and checking your texts and right, all that right. stuff. So it's a kind of a distracted time in terms of focus on it. Um, but I still end up meeting young artists that are like 18 years old, 20 years old, working with them. And as soon as they sit down to play, you go, holy shit. I know. Wow. Brandy Carlisle, incredible. Oh, yeah. Oh, my God. Yeah, there's so much talent away. out yeah. there. But a it, lot of the issues you. are, it's, but a lot of the issues yeah. are, the, 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 is the business is like when we were coming up in this, you had the record labels, you knew we were going to get screwed at some point by this whole process. You guys knew that even back then. Yeah, you knew it going in. But they could get you airplay, they got you on the radio, they did promotion, they got you into into record stores and and you would do in-store shows and all. Mm -hmm. Where now I work on some amazing records and right after we finish, they're they're indie financed. And then you get people from who I just worked with calling going, any idea who we could play? You know, what, what can we do with this? Because there's no anything, you know, right. you're, if you're going to be like, have like, like, and especially with things like TikTok, mm-hmm. where you, your snippets are like in the seconds, you know, you got 20 seconds to really sell yourself. Right. It's a different time. So it's real hard for, there's a lot of talent, but clubs, when I was growing up, you could go jam in clubs and meet people. And now if you wanted to go play in a club, you have to pay to play in the place. And right. I mean, it's a different Security world. team, yeah, all the yeah, old nine yards. Very yeah. different the world. other thing about music, when I'm born in 61, right? So let's say 1970, I'm listening to the music, you know, I'm not listening. If you go back 50 years, that's 1920. Mm. There's not much recorded music that we're listening to from the 20s. I don't start listening to music, meaning like in my life or my parents' life. Right. It comes big bands. It started kind of like from the 30s and 40s and 50s. I know the 50s, which is only 20 years behind. Mm. Now, what do we got to do? We only had maybe eight stations on TV. Yeah. We only right. had two, three kind of rock and roll stations on AM radio. At this time, so there. And what do you do? You know, in between, you're playing music, you're buying albums, you're playing. There's nothing. Else. We didn't have computers. We didn't have. We had more time to, you know, listen and less things to. You know, there was only a, a less distractions, certain, yeah. less distractions, yeah. Yeah. and only a certain amount of places to find the music. Yeah. So now my kids, who are you know, they have all the way. If yeah, the big bands. My kid actually listens to big band. He's a freshman in college. Nice. He loves Sinatra Station. Cool. That's and great. at the same time, he's a rapper. Loves oh, his yeah. raps. I love it. Yeah. So, you know what I mean? So they have a huge amount of music, mm-hmm. more than we'll ever have. And the problem is finding the Brian Wilsons or the John Lennons or or whoever. Amidst all that other Amidst, clutter. And it's, yeah. and it's yeah. not, and people, you know, they, sh- can I say the words? Like, yeah, yeah go for it. Right. You know, yeah. So, like, you know, people shit. Some, and that's the hard thing is when we get old, and you know, and, and we all shit on everything. Yeah. But, you <laughs> know, and when, like they don't make music like they used to. I said, no, there is good music. You just got to find it. Yeah. And, and I'm lucky that my kids turn me on to things. And it's, sometimes it's like, yeah, I hate that. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. Sure. We were yeah. in the bar cool. last night, not yeah. in the bar, but, you know, it's yeah. like, I was like, God, I hate this crap. It was, right. <laughs> because it was just, it wasn't, it was, I don't know what it is, just beats per minute. Boom, 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 boom. Right, yeah. the RPMs. Yeah. Yeah. It was like yeah. almost like dance. Yeah, yeah, Going yeah. on like electro <laughs> dance. Yeah, yeah. 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 it was. Yes. Yeah. I, I was You're not a popping locker. Yeah. Well, <laughs> yeah, no, I, I always equate when I hear that, it sounds like a cat throwing up a fur ball before the big sausage comes flying again, there's a whole niche of people that that's like a pilgrimage and that's oh, like no, right. sure. yeah. electronic music. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. That's yeah. the other thing is they understand it. It's, it's like, emotional to people. Yeah. I mean, I love electronic music. Yeah. I totally, yeah. I'm from Detroit. So right. I mean, that totally is like electronic music country there. Yeah. Exactly. So yeah. I get it. And exactly. It's like the things, it's like he did an amazing, I mean, when there's a classic jazz album called uh, Billy Cobham Spectrum, which he's famous for. Mm. Yeah, way outside of what he was doing at the time. And that was the music I was listening to. But my wife, she slit her wrist to listen to some of the music I loved. Right, right, right. You right. know, or love. Yeah. But that's yeah. the beauty of the arts, is it's all subjective. Mm-hmm. You yeah. know, you could go to an art museum and there's a painting and one person could be looking at it 
tears running down the street and the, uh, their cheeks and the next person standing next to them going, I'm a piece of shit. Yeah, right. completely well, because uninterested. Because yeah. And they're Basquiat. both right. Yeah. Absolutely. And you're both right. And yeah. so I don't deny any music. There's, I have things I like better than others and I would never fault anybody for liking something I don't like because sure, yeah. it's all subjective. And that's to me, is one of the exciting parts of being in the arts is that 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 the, the wide breadth yeah that that it that it really draws and, and the emotions that it touches on different levels for different people mm-hmm. so it's really to me it, it's that. a thrilling do you think that, you know just thought of something do you because I'm thinking back again my dad's been gone for so many years yeah. and there's guys that stop playing so I think or people that stop playing they stop where they are mentally yeah do you think your playing keeps you a little more um, open-minded. Hmm. Yeah, I, I I feel fortunate that I grew up in a in a household where uh, my parents weren't musicians. They could plunk around a little bit, do things, but for the most part, but they were very eclectic in their listening. So they had a pretty extensive vinyl collection mm-hmm. of you know classical and and big band and and you know lounge and all that stuff. Nice. Um, so it kind of exposed me to a lot of music and. It, uh, I've always just enjoyed the breadth of musical genres. So it, 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 when I started doing studio work, it's really almost a, a necessity. Yeah. Because I show up to work and I generally have no idea what I'm showing up to. And you got to be ready for anything that's thrown at you. And it could be a reggae date. It could be an R&B date. It could be a hip hop date, country. And you've got to have enough in your kind of m- musical Rolodex to be able to, like, as soon as you look down at the thing and you hear, like, a demo or something, you go, I know exactly what I need to do for this mm-hmm. one. Mm-hmm. Or, you know, within the parameters of that genre. And, yeah. and then you try to address each song as an individual. You, you don't go in with a preconceived idea. You have maybe an idea of what's going to be needed of you. But you look at each song and try to make the most that you can out of that individual song. And that's the adventure every time. It's just... Uh, Wow. And you and you don't have the and the thing that's fascinating about studio work that is unlike a lot of other jobs is if you like kind of a, a job where you go and you go ah, it just feels like shit today let's, right, right, let's right. just you know we'll, we'll finish it up tomorrow let's go get a slice and you know just you can't with studio work because yeah. that moment is the only time you've got in there hmm. for that artist for that project whatever you're handed a blank ca- blank canvas every day and you have to leave with a masterpiece. And if you you could be in there with 105 fever and you've shown up, um, either you have no options. There, there's no, we'll get to it tomorrow. Right. Sometimes you're on a long-term project and maybe a song will be readdressed if you're in there for a week and you might go, now we're in the groove for like the second day or mm. something. So you go, let's go back and listen to what we did yesterday. Yeah. And you might go, let's do it one more time today now that we're kind of in the pocket with this. But generally, man, you got to get your asses on the line the minute you sit down in that chair and you and you can't you don't have the luxury of saying, I don't feel it today. You've got to right. feel it. Yeah. Um, yeah. So it's it's an interesting job. It's a, so you know, cool. people always just listen to music, but they don't know the process right. of the recording. And it, is a, it can be incredibly stressful. And, uh, and especially it, when you get an orchestra of 80 people. And then, oh, yeah. And then if, wow. especially if there's a solo or they lay, you know. You're laid out in the open. It's like ho ho. Yeah, you know, yeah. you better nail it. Yeah, yeah. it's the, the 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 air in a studio can be really thick, hmm. um, and not in a negative way, but the focus that's being felt in there by everybody listening to each other's parts and how this is really going to come together. And generally, the best stuff comes in very early takes, so everybody's right. like on their game like from the get go. Hmm. And uh, you hope you've got a great engineer that knows to be, you know, whatever the format is, if it's digital or, or tape or whatever, um, that they're on it from the very first note. Because sometimes if you, you, the worst thing would ever be is if you start a tune and you're playing and it just happens and you look in the studio and the guy goes, Yeah, no, it's, it's <laughs> not, it's not good. And, and, but the really good engineers know to have everything ready to go. I mean, when I, when I'm in the studio with Streisand, I know we got like six songs to do on that day. Mm. And uh, I know that like when you sit down, you want those headphones 
as close to a mix as possible. You're not just sitting there with nothing in them and you're wasting the first hour trying to get a headphone mix. Right. Mm-hmm. So you really hope that everything's there because Crap. you know, especially with somebody like her, she's singing live vocals when you're in there and singing like it's the finished vocal. And many times it is. I've done direct to two track with her with a 60 piece orchestra. Golly. And she's in there singing her, the finished vocal. You walk in after you cut the track and you sit down in the control room and it's done. Yeah, at that point. It's, wow. there's no mixing, yeah. no nothing. It's which hard. is so it's rare in that oh, business, yeah, no, right? But that's when you have the pros. Like that. yes, that's, that's yeah. how it was in the '60s mm-hmm. because in the '60s, there was the original. The reason the '60s was it, like they only had mono in the early days, mm-hmm. so you only had one track. So I remember Glenn Campbell was a part of the Wrecking Crew part, and he said, "You know, you got 15, 20 people in a room. Everybody was Michael Jordan mm-hmm. because you can't screw up." Yeah. Because I that guy screws up, we got to start from the beginning. We don't just pop in and bar 32. You know, we have to go back and start. And we got to, don't forget, we have, we have a time limit. So everybody's got to be on there, to, you know. And Sinatra was like that, where they yeah. would do Sinatra. They would basically rehearse before Frank even came in. And they would rehearse the shit out of a song, mm-hmm. you know, with the big band. And then all of a sudden Frank comes in. And they would make sure this, the chairs were, wouldn't squeak. Nothing was going to blow it. Right, right. And he, yeah. go, he goes, boom, boom, one, two takes, three takes, and he's out. There's a great story of um, uh, my dad was on, um, uh, oh, God, help me out, the famous song, Strangers in the Night. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. so they all rehearsed it. And the thing was, G- uh, Jimmy Bowen was a producer, and he was Dean Martin's producer as well and they on Reprise Records. And he said, Frank, you should get the kid Jimmy to do a song, the, you know, the, all right, all right, all right, all right. So they <clears throat> they come in. Frank does you know "Strangers of Night." Does his three takes, and at the end where he starts scatting, you know all mm-hmm. that. He doesn't remember the lyrics. That's what that is. Really? Yeah. He's wow. like, he's like, so at the end where they're listening back, and Frank now at this point it says two. It says split session me hour and a half with Frank and hour and a half with Dean. You know they break. Frank leaves the room. And the producer, it was, uh, Rubini, was one of the guys, oh, the okay. ranger. And he goes, and Bowen says, what do you think? He goes, it's either going to be a hit or a horrible bomb. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, but he, Frank leaves, and they now they do Dean's song, whatever the Dean song is. And just in the third take of Dean's song, Frank comes in and says, let's go, guys. We got to go. Meaning, like, he's breaking up the session because he and F- Dean got to get to Vegas. Wow. But don't forget, he's the owner of the label. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And Dean So goes, he can make that move. He, he, yeah. made, he goes, all right, boys. And Dean goes, all right, boys, we're out of here. You know, and that's how and that session ends. <laughs> and um, boy, it'd be great to find that. That, <laughs> that would outtake. be fabulous. <laughs> but, yeah, but the, right. It's the professionalism. It's like, you don't have time to mess around. Yeah. Yeah. There's no yeah. screwing up. Yeah. Do you remember guys, and you don't have to necessarily name names, yeah. but I there had to be a handful of guys that were just like, oh, we got to work with this guy. He never practices. He's never prepared. Or at that level, oh. is everybody really always pretty much that you work with I on the top the of their game? I think the real issue would be maybe producers okay. more than the musicians. You would end up working with a producer who you, know, who you know really doesn't know what the fuck he's doing. Yeah, 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 and, yeah. and the best of those guys would be the ones that just they hired the right band and just shut up. Yeah. yeah. You know, I, I, I would always say, you know, to me, the best producer is he's quiet and he knows when the band's hungry and he orders food and puts his plastic <laughs> down. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Um, but then, then others, you know, when, you, when you're in the studio with like the great producers that really had their stuff together, and, and it's just this beautiful thing that happens. But, Synergy. But, almost, the, yeah. but the, the, generally the players that have come at that level, um, they get it. Yeah. They, they know what they're doing, and they're they, they're all, they're there because their reputation is founded in, in reality. Where a lot of producers, I mean, I would say, look at a musician comes in, he sits down, starts playing. You know, immediately if the guy's got his shit together. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Engineer starts pulling up sounds. You go, oh, he's a great engineer. Producer could sit there for years, and you still have no idea what they know because it's a kind of a nebulous position. Yeah, right. Some. Some are not musical, but they know a good song, and yeah. their real gift is picking songs. Other ones really, um, like I worked with. Um, a, there's a producer in LA named Ron Fair, and you know uh, I, I did like Vanessa Carlton's "A Thousand Miles" oh, album, great song. Then, yeah. and like well, 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 we're sitting there cutting it. He's producing, and he's got sheets, of, and he's writing all the orchestrations for for the string date. 
you know, and you're going, Jesus Christ, God, yeah. he's so musical. I mean, he's yeah. just got, and you, you, it runs the whole gamut in production from sure. people that really, you know, I, I remember talking to David Anderley once who produced like Mamas and Papas, and I, I did like Rita Coolidge and Chris Christopherson, all these people with him and Corey Wells from Three Dog Night. Yeah. And I would talk to Dave one day and I said, how'd you end up, you know, at A&M? And he says, I went to high school with Herb Alpert. Yeah. Oh, yeah, and wow. he said, he said, I'm starting a label. You want to be a producer? But David wasn't a, that much of a musician, but he really knew songs, and he had an incredibly great demeanor in the studio, so he could make people really want to be working together. So he, he wasn't saying, well, in bar 34, yeah. do this, you know. Yeah. He just sat back and let everybody find their place because he trusted his band, but he knew how to pick tunes and how to create an atmosphere of creativity. So it runs that whole gamut with different people. And that's really, the, once again, the thing is like, I go to work every day and I'm still got the same piece of firewood in my hands that yeah, I'm yeah, playing, yeah. but every day is unique. Yeah. Yeah. So you're every, it's an adventure every time you walk in the studio. And, and that's the thing that where people say you've been doing this so long, you know, that's doesn't make it, it boring. Fun. And you go, never. Yeah. Yeah, it's exciting every yeah. time you go to work, and That's so, cool. and some days you kind of walk out of it and you go, nobody's ever going to hear this. This is horrible, and other times I've walked out and said this is unbelievable, and lo and behold, the horrible one ends up being a hit, and the other one right, never gets right, released. Right. Yes. But I look at you know if you called me and you and you wanted to do a song, I would give you the same attention on your date that I would give Phil Collins. Hmm. It, that doesn't change when you when you say yes to that phone call and you sit down in that chair, yeah. you do your job. It's go time. Yeah. 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 You got to so, stay close to the, close to the fame to have skin in the game, right? Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Very good. Well, it's funny because that's, that's the, you just said skin in the game and the band, immediate family, they have an album coming out in which they wrote a song for the movie called Skin in the Game. No way, really? Yeah, that's, yeah. That's, I haven't seen it. That's, that's the name that's, of the new album. Yeah. Yeah. That's nice. Awesome. So, <laughs> I, thought you, I thought you just said that because you had a... No. no. Oh, man, no. I mean, you, you must be psychotic. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm like Latoya Jackson, except I see the chair coming this time. Yeah. <laughs> now, Leland, you're going to be at uh, Tone Vendor Records yeah. here this coming afternoon. up. Okay, cool. cool. So, yeah, what time are we there? Uh, four four o'clock. So by the time you hear this, get, get on the road now. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah from four to six, so get out of there. Signing. Okay. Yeah. Very, very nice. cool. Book signing is a very unusual book. You don't have to even read to enjoy this book. Oh, I like mm. those kind of books. Yeah. Okay. It's yeah. 6,000 photographs. Cool. I like it. Oh, man. Everybody I've. I, not everybody, because I, I, I had, didn't even use 7,000 pictures, but it's 6,000 pictures of people flipping me off. Um, <laughs> I love and, yeah, and, and, and it's so much fun because I look and there's Charlie Watts and there's Jeff Beck and James Taylor and Phil Collins and you, you name it. You know, it's all kinds of characters. Jay Leno. and What's the name of this book? Everybody Loves Me. <laughs> <laughs> this and, is so and, great. And, and for your free audience, if they don't make it there, I have a, a, a website for it. It's, it's Scholars. Beard.com. Got it. Okay, I'll put that in yeah. comments for everybody. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> guys, this was such a fun talk. Such a great time. Uh, this was really awesome. I know you guys got more important things to do than no, hang out with us today, but uh, uh, really appreciate y'all yeah. coming oh, into the studio. Really cool to get so some of this cool. insight from you, know, you guys. If you want to see the trailer also, they could go to uh, immediatefamilyfilm.com. Great. Got it. Because uh, if you just do immediate family, you'll get a marriage therapist. So whatever okay. works for you. <laughs> oh, right, exactly. Uh, you they film, might need both. Yeah, if you add film at, after a meeting family, you'll see. Um, it's great. Yeah. And the movie plays what? Tomorrow night? Tomorrow night at 7 o'clock. Lewis Auditorium. Okay. Yeah. Very, very cool. Cool. It's going to be a great time. Can't wait to check it Thanks, out. Thanks, guys. Yeah, it's great. Thank you guys so much. Thank Danny you. Leland, Such an honor. you guys are awesome. Yeah. Thank you. Appreciate your time. And uh, Dude, wow, man. That was an interview. That this, was awesome. This is probably my favorite of all of 2024. Yes! Wow. That was so fun. <laughs> You're just started. That's great. <laughs> yeah, we'll, man. We'll very cool. Let's tune in tomorrow and see, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we'll see how this goes. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Yeah. <laughs> That might change by tomorrow. <laughs> no, really fun, Amazing. man. Really yeah, fun. Yeah, yeah. Great. Thank you so much. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, and yeah, go out and check that out tomorrow, 7 o'clock. Yes, it's going to be awesome. Yeah. 
And um, really, Davey, we don't have time for anything else. No man. worries, dude. Yeah, Let's, uh, I'm legendary. just going to kind of hit on our sponsors, let everybody know who uh, helps us have these great conversations, including All American Air, uh, Bin 39, our friends at the Old Town Trolleys, Panache, United Way. Am I missing anybody there? Nope, anybody you got else? It. Okay, cool. <laughs> you guys, this was such a fun show. Woo! We really enjoyed this one. I know you guys uh, loving it out there as well. So um, thank you for hanging with us. And hey, have a great weekend. We'll talk to you Tuesday. Bye, everybody.